Meanwhile, Jacob had settled down where his father had lived, the land of Canaan. Joseph and his brothers. This is the story of Jacob. The story continues with Joseph, 17 years old at the time, helping out his brothers in herding fox. These were his half-brothers, actually, the sons of his father's wives, Milah and Zilpah, and Joseph brought his father bad reports on him. Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the child of his old age. And he made him an laboratory and embroidered coat. When his brothers realized that their father loved him more than them, they grew to hate him. They wouldn't even speak to him. Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said, listen to this dream I had. We were all out in the field gathering bundles of wheat. All of a sudden, my bundle stood straight up, and your bundle circled around it and bowed down to mine. His brother said, so, you're going to rule us? You're going to boss us around? And they hated him even more than ever because of his dreams and the way he talked. He had another dream and told this one also to his brothers. I dreamed another dream. The sun and the moon and the eleven stars bowed down to me. When he told it to his fathers and brothers, his father reprimanded him. What's this of all this dream? Am I your mother and your brothers all supposed to bow down to you? Now his brothers were really jealous. But his father brooded over the whole business. His brothers had gone off to Shesh, hmm, excuse me, Sheshon, where they were pasturing their father's flocks. Israel said to Joseph, "Your brothers are with flocks in Sheshon. Come, I want to send you to them." Joseph said, "I'm ready." We have a family squabble going on here, and we got to remember. Uh, it seems to be in the generations of the family that this squabble is going on. You remember last week we talked a little bit about Jacob and how he had that all night wrestling match with God. He was trying to deal with a soul wound that created in him behaviors that uh, were not healthy. And finally, after many years of uh, running games on other people, of trying to trick them into giving up stuff for him, and also having himself been tricked by a very shrewd father-in-law, uh, he had enough of it. And so he wrestled all night with God, hoping against hope that uh, God will somehow or another heal this soul wound. And of course the source of that soul wound was his own relationship with his father. That his father loved his brother more. And that created a hurt that just hung on Jacob for a very, very long time and haunted him throughout all of his days. And it took that all-night wrestling match with Yahweh to finally come to terms with him and Yahweh blessing him, but a blessing that came with a cost that for the rest of his life he will have to limp, wounded by that exchange. So now we have the next generation of kids, Jacob's children, and there's 12 of these boys, and um, guess what? Uh, there's a whole lot of soul wounding going on here, too. And it's going on in part because Jacob ends up doing the very thing his father did. He had a faith, and he lorded over that faith, and he made sure that faith, which was the youngest, uh, would get whatever he wanted, whatever he needed. And the other brothers began to resent Joseph for this. And so we see this dysfunction in the family creating incredible amounts of hatred and anger. And then Joseph, a 17-year-old. And you know, when you're 17-year-old, 
I don't want to offend any 17-year-olds in the group, but I remember when I was 17. You know everything you need to know. And you're not aware that you don't know what you don't know. And so Joseph is a very bright and engaging young child. Joseph has been set apart by Yahweh himself to become a great and grand leader of the Hebrew people. Uh, Joseph has these dreams. He has these dreams. And they're bold dreams. And they're grand dreams. And they are greater than life dreams. And his mistake is he sort of tells them to his brothers and sort of rubs their face in these dreams. And in these dreams, uh, he comes out like this great leader that will unite the 12 tribes into one healthy, fully functioning nation of when you think about it, this is something God probably wants more than anything else. God wants these 12 tribes, these 12 families, all descendants of Abraham and Isaac. Become unified. So that they could do the work God wants them to do in the world. And they would do it much better if they were one healthy family, not 12 distinct units. <laughs> and so Joseph's dream is a significant dream, it is a God centered dream. But he released that dream in this family of incredible dysfunction. Where there's jealousy and anger and hurt and all that stuff works together. And so Joseph's dream intensifies the anger his brothers We all dream. We all dream. When we're young, we often dream about who is it that's going to become my significant other? My spouse. Who is it I will marry? Who is it I will have a family with? So we dream about having a family. We dream about getting a career. We dream about settling down, getting our first home. All of these things are God-centered dreams. They are they, they're what drive us in our youth to begin to think about the rest of our life. And if we're in a healthy environment, we have the resources that we can act upon them. We grow and mature and live into them with a certain amount of joy and expectation. And then we as people have dreams. Dreams for our nation, dreams for our world, dreams for our congregation. And many of these dreams are God-centered. And if they are introduced in a time where things seem to be working and functioning, we begin to get a sense of hope that we are moving in the right path. But the Joseph story gives us a picture of what happens when we dream bold things in a dysfunctional situation. And I think we all know that the uh, times we live in are very dysfunctional. People can't talk to each other anymore. We don't compromise anymore. 
we got all these little wars floating around in the world. And it makes it harder and harder for us to dream beyond our own situation. It's like the brothers that Joseph encountered. They were unable to see beyond their own needs. And so they were unable to take seriously Joseph's vision of a unified family. So what do we do? Do we just sort of chalk up and say dreaming is ridiculous, it's for fools? I once heard a long time ago that if you get through your 30s with just one of your dreams intact, you're doing good. We live in a dysfunctional time. There is always people out there telling us what we can and can't do and what we can and cannot see. The story of Joseph the story of a dreamer caught in a very seriously dysfunctional situation. So, this story could teach us a thing or two. He said, go and see how your brothers and the flocks are doing and bring me back a report. He sent them off from the valley of Hebron to Shishem. A man met him as he was wandering through the fields and asked him, What are you looking for? I'm trying to find my brothers. Do you have any idea where they are grazing their flocks? The man said, They left here, but I overheard them say, Let's go to Dothan. So Joseph took off, tracked his brothers down, and found them in Dothan. They spotted him off in the distance. By the time he got to them, they had cooked up a plot to kill him. The brothers were saying, Here comes that dreamer. Let's kill him and throw him into one of those old sisters. We can say that a vicious animal ate him up. We'll see what his dreams amount to. If you look at the landscape of history, human history, there's always been this sense, this tension that exists between those who vision and dream great and bold things for a people and those who don't vision and dream great things. Often the dreams of those who are visionaries are frightening and scary to those who seem incapable of embracing any sense of vision or dream. Just think throughout the history of the world, some of the great thinkers and leaders who dare to dream bold and wonderful things for their people and the movements that rise up to quash those dreams. <laughs> Think of uh, Abraham Lincoln, who even though when he entered the presidency wasn't quite sure what to do with the slavery issue, became very clear and focused after he entered the presidency and became a dream of his to not only end slavery, but find a way to reconcile with the South. And they shot him. You think of uh, Martin Luther King, over 50 years ago, on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, shouting, I have a dream. And we're all very familiar with that. And that dream has shaped so much of where we have come as a nation, but he didn't live but five more years. As a child, I was struck with the dream, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. Two and a half years after that was said, that dreamer was assassinated. 
There is just this natural pushback against people who dream bold and wondrous things. Jesus of Nazareth had this dream that we can cultivate a relationship with God that would be intimate and holy and life-sustaining. But in order to get to that dream, some of the oppressive behaviors of the culture around him had to be challenged and they crucified. This is the situation that Joseph has been brought into, given a God-centered dream to become a great and glorious leader that would unite his people. When his people did not want to be united. And so here they are, plotting and planning killing their own flesh and blood, their own brother. I particularly like the translation that was found in the old Revised Standard Version when one of the brothers said, come let us kill this dreamer and let us see what becomes of this dream. Reuben heard his brothers talking and intervened to save them. We're not going to kill him. No murder. Go ahead and throw him in the cistern out here in the wild, but don't hurt him. Reuben planned to go back later and get him out and take him back to his father. When Joseph reached his brothers, they ripped off the fancy coat he was wearing, grabbed him, and threw him into a cistern. The cistern was dry. There wasn't any water. Then they sat down to eat supper. Looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites on their way from Gilead. Their camels loaded with spices, ointments, and perfumes to sell in Egypt. Judah said, Brothers, what are we going to get out of killing our brother and concealing the evidence? Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites, but not kill him. He is, after all, our brother, our own flesh and blood. His brothers agreed. By that time, Midianite traders were passing by. His brothers pulled Joseph out of the cistern and sold him for 20 pieces of silver to the Ishmaelites, who took Joseph with them down to Egypt. This is the word of God. What happens to a God-centered dream? It finds a way of surviving. It just does. And we see this in this story. Because the original plan was to kill him. But then Reuben got cold feet. He suggested, why don't we do this? Then Judah got to thinking, we can make a little money on the deal. And so they end up planning, plotting to sell him into some kind of slavery. So they threw him in a pit. and threw him in this cistern. Um, which, being in the desert, is dry most of the time. And uh, if we would have read the whole, the whole package, we would have known that they'd taken the, the multicolored cloak that his father gave him because he loved him so much. And they put goat's blood on it. They're going to take the cloak back to their old dad as they see some wild animals about him. And uh, figured that he'll be a slave somewhere. End of the dream, right? The God-centered dream is going to die in that system. But it doesn't. It doesn't. The Midianites have to come along, pull him out of the cistern, and then they sell him to the Ishmaelites. And the Ishmaelites take him to Egypt, and they sell him to the Egyptians. He's imprisoned. And he dreams again. And through his dreaming, he's able to communicate to the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh calls him to his court and makes him his assistant. So Joseph.
Joseph's going to be okay. But what about the dream that he had that got him in trouble? What about the dream for a unified Hebrew family? Well, if I were to go on and tell you the whole story, you would all, how many of you know this? I would hope most of you know this. A famine hits the land, and each one of those brothers, each with their own tribe, seemed incapable of providing the leadership needed to get them through this crisis. Meanwhile, back in Egypt, the Pharaoh is doing very well with the famine because his top aide, Joseph, is managing the situation for him, and somehow or another has created this incredible warehouse filled with foodstuffs so the Egyptian people are going to survive in grand style. Difference in leadership. Joseph has leadership capabilities. The rest of the brothers are only thinking about their own little piece of land and their own little tribe their own little selves. So it gets so bad back in Israel that they're not going to survive. So they send a couple of the brothers to Egypt and Joseph protects his identity to the brothers, invites them all to come. And so in the end, these tribes, people, have to come together, have to make the journey to Egypt, have to bow down to their brother. And through Joseph's skill and compassion, because he forgives his brothers, because the vision God laid on his heart was bigger than any negative feeling Joseph would have for his family. Joseph is able to say God's people. So the God-centered dream survives. Not all dreams are God-centered dreams. God-centered dreams will survive. I remember one day I was, I, I needed to pull over and get some gasoline and I went into this little place and there was this kid, he looked like he was 17 or 18 behind the counter. After I pumped my gas, I went in to pay for it. And as I was paying for it, he was just beaming. And he looked at me and he said, see that car out there in that car? That's my brand new car. It's my first car. And he was so happy. And so overjoyed. And I congratulated him on that. And then he ruined it all. <laughs> he said, I want to get vanity plates for my car. <laughs> vanity plates? I don't really hear 18-year-olds getting vanity plates, but... Okay, and he said, and I want to tell people who read my vanity plate, well, I can't tell you what it is because it's really crass and crude. It's a possible human act. You can probably use your imagination to figure it out. But he said, the Bureau of Motor Vehicles won't allow me to do that. Duh. <laughs> <laughs> 
So he said, I've been sitting here all day. He pulls up this, this, this spiral, spiral banger. Uh, and he had a list of combination of letters and numbers, row after row of them. He says, I've been trying to find the combination that will say what I want to say and will get by the censors of the Bureau of Motor Vehicles. And I think I added something like, what a waste of brain matter. <laughs> That's not a God-centered dream. There are a lot of dreams out there that are superfluous and silly and ridiculous. And they deserve to die. They just... But a God-centered dream will find a way. And it may not necessarily be within the boundaries of the lifetime we live, because think about God, and God's got all eternity to work, and so God instills this dream, and we see it in, 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 in our faith, and the vision that our faith portrays. Um, and we've been doing this for 2,000 years, and we strain to get closer and closer and closer. But it will happen. And the story of Joseph shows that it will happen. This is not the way God probably envisioned the Hebrew people becoming unified. But they became unified. And it was not the place where God envisioned his people to share in that unity. But it was a unity just the same. And so that dream then becomes retooled to lead the people to the next place. But there's some wonderful ironies in this whole story that I think are very important for us today. If it were not for the Ishmaelites, Joseph would most likely have died in that system. The Ishmaelites rescued him. Do you know who the Ishmaelites were? They were the descendants of Ishmael. Do you know who Ishmael was? When uh, Abraham was pining away for a son and Sarah was unable to provide one, Abraham and Sarah got this idea, and Sarah was in on it that he uh, take advantage of Hagar, who was Sarah's aide, maid, assistant, whatever you want to call it. And through that relationship, Ishmael was born. And then after Ishmael was born, Sarah got very jealous and very hurt. And very angry, and so she insisted to Abraham that he expel Hagar and Ishmael from the family. Take them out. Leave them with nothing. Push them out. And Abraham does that. So irony of ironies. The descendants of the one who was rejected becomes the group of people that allows the God-centered dream to survive. I think that's really interesting. And of course the Hebrew people are able to survive when they become the Jewish people. Israel. The Israelites become the Arabs. So what we have in the Middle East today is a dysfunctional family. The two sides of the family <coughs> warring to each other. All because Abraham was a little sloppy. But that's the way it is. But the thing about it is God used both sides to ensure the God-centered dream that survived. 
It's easy to get disillusioned. It's easy to feel so overwhelmed by all the stuff in the world. But if the dreams we have are God's dreams, There will be a day where they will all come together. And that's why we, children of faith, can be so bold as to try. Know that you are loved in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.